This episode is about the iTech 120X Pro lithium battery, specifically the results after 12 months of hard use while traveling around Australia and testing its performance, capacity and condition. Before I do, I just want to say this, as these videos seem to attract a fair amount of criticism from a select number of viewers. Now, iTech World did provide me this battery last year in exchange for a video review. It didn't have to be a positive review, it could be structured in any way that I seemed fit and include anything that I thought was appropriate. Now that video was released in 2023 and can be seen up here. And that was the end of that agreement. Today's episode is released by choice to help of those of you who are considering lithium, whether or not iTech World or not, to determine whether or not this is the best route of power management for your needs, particularly if you're considering an underbonnet solution. I will say it again like I have previously, I am not paid, endorsed, sponsored, or incentivized to talk about these units. There are no affiliate links in the description below. I am not receiving a cent from iTech World. If you choose to purchase one of these batteries as a result of this episode or any of my previous episodes. If I was, I'd be hesitant to add things like this. No voltage down here at the battery or 0.3 volts. Has the iTech World 120X lithium battery finally died for good? Something's not right there. In this episode, I'll be reviewing the 120X Pro after 12 months of use and talking about how I've used the battery, the terrain and the conditions of use, the physical condition, capacity testing the pack, considerations that you need to keep in mind, the issues I've experienced, and my final thoughts. Without further ado, let's get straight into today's episode. For those of you who may be joining us for the first time, we have been traveling around Australia for a period of 12 months, and for the vast majority of it, the 120X Pro unit was installed. The auxiliary battery in our Land Cruiser is primarily used to power our Waco CFX 65 litre fridge in the back, normally set to three degrees. But this in addition to a 12 volt oven, auxiliary lighting around the cruiser, a 1000 watt inverter for high demand 240 volt outlets, and USB chargers for phones, cameras, portable lights, skateboards, and drones. As we traveled into North Queensland, our Waco was converted into a freezer to preserve extra food for longer periods off grid. And this put significantly more strain on the capacity side of our battery. Not only was our compressor running much more frequently, trying to maintain a freezer set to minus 18 degrees, but the ambient temperature also increased as well, with daily averages in the mid 30 degree mark. Now, in addition to this, I really tried to push and test this unit, and I powered and charged a lot of devices off the vehicle's inverter that I would ordinarily use the powerhouse of a camper trailer to supply. And this has really pushed the limits of this pack. In order to gain some perspective on just how much this battery has been subjected to, we can look at the records held by our Victron shunt, which is installed in the cruiser to measure the current coming in and out of this unit. Now the record shows that since installing the battery, our average discharge per single cycle is 68 amp hours. But more importantly, our cumulative capacity drawn is a whopping 16,156 amp hours. And this is huge, particularly for only one year of use, and is definitely consistent with this unit being drawn and used every single day in a real world scenario while traveling around Australia. But this figure is equivalent to 134 total discharges, if we were measuring from 100% down to 0% state of charge. Now, of course, this hasn't been the case. Now, I haven't drawn it down 134 times, but from our records here, we can see that we have drawn it down to a state of complete discharge on eight occasions. And this has required a 12 volt jump pack to restart the battery and recommence that charging process. Now that's the stats from the battery itself, but the batteries perform very differently in varying conditions, including environmental, exposure to elements, and of course, terrain. Now the 120X has not been installed in a weekend warrior. Over the last 12 months of use, we have traveled some of the roughest, dustiest, and most corrugated terrain in Australia in some very hot climates. This includes tracks like Glasshouse Mountains, Fraser Island, Outback Queensland, the Daintree's Bloomfield Track, Cape York, including the Old Telegraph Track, the Savannah Way, the Outback Northern Territory, the Gibb River Road, Unsealed Tanami Road, the Old Garden Heritage Trail, and thousands and thousands of kilometers of highway driving towing our 3.2 ton camper. We have traversed multiple river crossings, some shallow, some not so much. Conquered hundreds of thousands of corrugations, which all took its toll on other vehicles in our convoy. We've completed slow rock hopping terrain in high 30 degree heat and pushed our engine to redline in soft sand on Fraser Island. Outside extraordinary weather and terrain events, I really do think that we've subjected this battery to everything that the average traveler would come to expect while traveling around Australia. In fact, I think we may have pushed it a little bit further than that again. 
Now this unit here has not spent a day inside the vehicle and all those tracks in the last 12 months, it has been sitting right here in the engine bay next to that hot engine. In total, we have completed over 40,000 kilometers in these conditions with this unit installed. So how has it held up? Well, it's time to get this battery out of the engine bay and into the back of the cruiser to take a closer look. The batteries out of the engine bay, I always like to start with the physical condition of the unit. And from initial inspection, I can't see anything that would have any cause for concern. It looks like it's held up just fine. The outer casing is in good condition. There are no visible or detectable cracks, breaks, fractures, or holes. And that orange top cap is still appears to be sealed well. In addition to that, there is no obvious distortion to the cap, unlike what we experienced with the 120X when it was over tightened. And the terminals are still in good condition, rust and corrosion free, and of course, secured. Apart from being dirty from the exposure to all of the elements in the engine bay, the battery seems to appear in like new structural condition. Now, if you haven't watched my episodes before, you may observe this heat shielding material that I've stuck onto the sides of the battery. And this, in my opinion, helps to reduce the internal temperatures when mounted in a location like the engine bay. Links will be in the description below to that product. Without wasting any more time, let's get straight into the capacity test of this 120X Pro. Now, I've been capacity testing my batteries for years now, and today's test is going to be conducted in the exact same manner that I conducted the test 12 months ago when this battery was brand new, and six months ago in my first review. I'm going to be using this battery discharge device, which I can set to a constant current discharge to draw down the battery to measure the capacity and exactly how much usable power we are able to access. For both the last two tests with the 120X Pro and today's testing, I have set that constant current to 10 amp. I set the battery up and recorded the data as we went, and here's how it performed. The discharge curve from the battery is precisely what we'd expect to see from a lithium chemistry, remaining in the high to mid 12 volts before quickly dropping off at the end as the battery becomes totally exhausted. We can compare these results directly with both the brand new 120X Pro test results and the results from six months ago, and we can see the nature of that discharge is almost identical except for at one point, and that is of course the length at which the test ran for, representing the capacity. 12 months ago, we achieved 132 amp hours. Six months ago, 129 amp hours, and today we received a total of 127 amp hours. This is a very, very good result, particularly with some of the conditions that we subjected this battery to in the last 12 months, but there are some very important considerations to take into account to bring this into context. Firstly, although we have lost 3.5% of our battery capacity, which would be less than iTech World's claimed specifications at 4,000 cycles, if extrapolated that far, we have to remember this battery is advertised at 120 amp hour capacity, which means that even after 12 months of some very, very hard use, we still have more battery capacity now than the manufacturer stated we would after when it was brand new. Now, of course, this too must be taken into context. Although we are achieving this high level of capacity, our focus needs to be on the cycle life degradation itself. Now, in the first six months, we lost about 2% capacity. In the last six months, again, a little under 2%. And this is where we can start to see some patterns form and make some predictions or assumptions looking into the future. If we're going to be losing about 4% capacity each year moving forward, this means that we have roughly four years of some very hard use in testing conditions of this battery here before it even reaches 80% capacity. Now what needs to be kept in mind is that 80% capacity of this unit here is still 105 amp hours of usable power, which is far more than any AGM or any other chemistry competitor in this category. In fact, with my old 105 amp hour AGM, I only achieved 74 amp hours of usable power before we dropped below 10.5 volt. And given the nature of the AGM chemistry and the discharge curve, my appliances started to shut down. Now, if we did make that assumption that we lost 4% capacity each year moving forward, then it would take nine and a half years before we hit that 74 amp hour mark, which is equivalent to my old AGM. And even if we lift that degradation to say 6%, that still gives us six years of seriously hard use. Now, there are some considerations to take into account with these test results as well. Firstly, we don't know if that cycle life degradation is going to be linear or not, which means that we can't count on it losing 4% per year, and this may increase as the battery becomes older and starts to wear out. Secondly, even if we do assume a 4% linear cycle life degradation, this is still going to be premature to the specifications listed by iTech World, which is 4,000 cycles retaining 80% capacity. 
Thirdly, we've got some positives as well, which is that this battery here is 30% of the weight of a traditional AGM and can discharge and recharge at much higher rates than any other chemistry on the market. Fourthly, if we do assume that this battery will last anywhere between six and nine years of use, it's going to outlast a traditional AGM. In my experience personally, I have never had an AGM last more than five years with the conditions that I place it upon, and even then I could guarantee that it would not last or not be holding 74 amp hours of usable power at that age. And lastly, we can't use an AGM battery in the way in which we use a lithium unit. Given the chemistry and the resistance within an AGM battery, we're just simply not able to draw the high voltage or the high requirements that I've required over the last couple of years from a more traditional chemistry. So regardless of the capacity, this lithium battery has achieved results that I otherwise could not have achieved. So this brings us on to the performance in both the terms of the discharge and the charging of this particular unit. Now I've mentioned in previous episodes that I don't have a specific way to measure the performance of this battery, but in its initial review, I was able to draw a constant 120 amps from this unit using every electrical circuit that I had available on this cruiser and it performed very well. I can confirm 12 months on, I'm still able to draw and use every electrical circuit in my cruiser, whether it be independently or together without any issues. Now, although it has provided some power in some extreme use conditions, there have been four occasions where the battery has shut down, and we'll get onto this in just a moment. But moving on to the charging profile, and again, no specific test to measure that. However, I've had no dramas recharging this unit outside of those four occasions, which we'll get onto, and it's been managed just fine by the Red Arc BCDC 1240D charger in the engine bay of my cruiser, which realistically puts in about 35 to 37 amps of charge while driving, and of course manages a 100 watt solar panel on the roof when parked in the sun. There's also been a handful of occasions in the last 12 months that I've used the Victron Smart Charger to directly charge this battery at a rate of about 15 amps by connecting it to the terminals of the 120X Pro to power it up from shore power. Now this battery charger runs directly to the battery, bypasses the shunt and therefore the data isn't collected, explain that difference between the discharged and charged energy on the Victron app. And finally, we move on to the issues that I've experienced because let's face it, there's no such thing as a perfect product. Now this battery has performed flawlessly for me with the exception of four occasions and all of these occasions being experienced within the last six months. Now these experiences were all on very long driving days. In fact, three of them were on consecutive driving days as we sought relief from the heat and the flies in our vehicles driving south on the Old Garn Heritage Trail in the Northern Territory and South Australia. The fourth occasion was driving from regional WA into the city and back again on a very long driving day. Now when I say very long driving days, we're talking between 8 and 12 hours of the engine running over the course of a single day. Of course, taking into consideration we've got rest breaks and lunch breaks in there as well. But what was happening is that the battery was shutting down without warning on the evening of these days, giving us anywhere between 0 and 3 volt, obviously not powering the appliances in the cruiser. So I got the old uh, multimeter out and I've confirmed what I thought to be the issue is the issue. We have got no voltage down here at the battery or 0.3 volts. Of course, my first thought was heat. On those three consecutive days out in the desert, it was hot and we were towing a 3.2 tonne camper at some slower speeds, anywhere between 30 and 80 kilometers an hour. But what confused me just a little is the fact that the battery was switching off late in the afternoon or early in the evening, well after the heat of the day had already passed. In fact, one time it was as we were rocking up to camp. Now I did lift the bonnet up to try and expel some of that heat faster and I did also use the jump pack to try and restart the battery but nothing worked. So I was a little concerned on that first day however, we have got full power back again. Lights on the side of the cruiser, working, oven, working, inverters working. So after just a couple of hours the battery restarted and ran just like it should. And this repeated itself on every time I experienced that issue. The battery would shut off late in the afternoon or early in the evening just for a couple of hours and then it would restart itself without any intervention. Now I don't have a definitive answer as to why this occurred but I still strongly believe it is down to heat. The BMS inside these batteries here is designed to shut off at the 80 degree mark and there is no doubt that it will be to turn back on again at a lower temperature around the 50 to 60 degree mark and this would explain the couple of hours it takes for the internals to cool back down before restarting. I'm still a little confused as to why this happened so late in the day or even early in the evening after the peak of the heat had already subsided but I will mention again that it was on some seriously long driving days where the engine was running for a prolonged period of time. 
Given that the battery is used day in and day out every single day, this problem represents less than 1% of the time spent with this unit, and it's only for a couple of hours at that. I can confirm that outside of those four occasions, the battery has performed flawlessly, and it's never had any issues or anything for cause or concern. So overall, the 120X Pro has performed very, very well in my experience. I've been very impressed with the rates and the currents that I can push through this system. As I mentioned earlier, I've achieved results with this unit that I couldn't have achieved otherwise without that lithium chemistry. The fact that I can mount it up here in the engine bay of my vehicle means that I'm not taking up a valuable storage space in the rear of my cruiser, which gives me more room and flexibility for some of the other gear that we take on our trips. Now, yes, the 120X Pro is a pricey unit, coming in at twice the price of a standard Full River 105 amp hour AGM battery, which is the unit I was using prior to switching to lithium. But for me personally, I've achieved that value for money in the form of weight savings, the size, the capacity, and of course, the power capabilities of this unit. Now, despite many other people using lithium in similar case scenarios like mine and complaining of capacity loss or total battery failure, I've been very impressed with this, what could only be described as a budget lithium battery, being able to hold its own and retain that high capacity. I'm under no false pretense that lithium batteries are not specifically designed to deal with the heat and the elements that I'm exposing them to in the engine bay of my Land Cruiser. But iTech World warrant this battery for underbonnet use, and this is exactly why I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm going to use the battery in the application they warrant it for and see just how much life we're going to get out of it. Now, I'm not out here to advertise lithium batteries or to try to sell them to any of you, but just to see exactly how far a unit like this will go with the harsh conditions that I place upon it. Either way, I hope the information in this episode has been helpful and given you a realistic insight as to what to expect if purchasing a product like this, whether it be iTech World or otherwise, and maybe it's helped point you in the right direction as to whether or not you're going to adopt this lithium technology in the engine bay like I have of my cruiser. Either way, whether or not we see you out on the tracks or not, we'll be sure to see you next time on Exploring Oz. Cheers.